Andy, ¿cómo estás? How are you doing? Muy bien, very good, thank you. Under okay. under the circumstances, I'm feeling good. Well, but you are in Canary Islands, yeah. <laughs> so I think now with the with the nice weather, you are enjoying a good time. <laughs> yeah, nice weather. I don't know. It looks cloudy. It looks like rain. So, but it's still it's cozy. It's not cold, so everything is fine. And wow. we had few, a few beautiful summer days already. So, and sooner or later, it has to rain, as we all know. So, <laughs> how are you? Good. How are you dealing with the restric restrictions there in Canary Island? Yeah, you have to get used to it. But then again, it's the way it is. You have to learn to live with it. Um, we are back to, I think, stage two, which means. Uh, you are allowed to go inside again and have a meal in the, in, inside the restaurant, which is not so important over here on the Canary Islands, as you all know. Most mm -hmm. of the people like to sit out there on the terrace. So, yeah, but everything looks a bit more friendly now. Yeah. And uh, I think they're, sh they're going to close at 12 o'clock for the next week and not uh, 11 o'clock. So life is getting back to a little bit of more normality because... If you ask me, for example, I'm always going down to the beach and having a nice little jogging most of the times at 11 o'clock in the night because nobody's on the beach. Yeah. So uh, if you go jogging down there at 10 o'clock, you probably have to fight against 30 or 40 dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, every, everybody's walking out there along the beach with the dogs, so it's not, not very nice to go jogging at this time. So for me, it's always perfect at like a, around 11 So I'm super happy when I can do that again, because then most of the times I do my jogging for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then I'm heading back home, 12-ish, like midnight, perfect time for me. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> and are you um, update to the um, situation in Spain? Because you are in Canary Island, in Canary Island. But, for example, um, do you know about the situation, for example, in Madrid with the, with the voting process uh, last weekend? No. What happened there? Well, there was, uh, there was uh, elections. Uh, I don't know if it's the correct um, word in English. But um, they have to, uh, the people from Madrid had to, had to choose the, the president of the community. Oh. So, did it go good or bad? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it depends. If you want to go to restaurants and bars, uh, awesome. But if you want to be um, healthy in the hospitals and, the, um, and all that kind of stuff, maybe it's not the best choice for Madrid. But, well, that's not the point today. <laughs> so, we have to wait and see. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, well, you released your your new album, Halloween. Um, you have uh, uh, you have written most of the most of the songs of this album, but I would let you know uh, because now you have to separate the parts of the voices between you, uh, Michael, and some of them, Kai. Mm -hmm. um, Who has rule in that in that process? Is in your oh, okay. in your, well, in that, your that responsibility was, or how? That was a bit, a bit of a twist, actually. Sometimes, sometimes it was automatically decided by Michael and myself, because very often Michael said, "I don't want to sing this; it's too brutal." So <laughs> I sang it. Sometimes I said, "Look, if it's that high-pitched voice, you're, we want to have clean." like really nice high-pitched clean voice it must be michael because if i go up there and sing the same line it will always sound a bit more brutal and yeah i think certain feelings demand more michael certain feelings demand more andy and so between michael and myself we decided probably 40 percent 50 percent which automatically were there where Michael said, don't, I don't want to sing this, you sing it. And I said, I, I will never sing this, you have to sing it. But there was a, the, the vast majority of at least 60%, which were not clear from beginning on. So we had a lot of work down there in the studio, checking out the lines, sing, Michael singing, me singing, then sometimes Michael doing the high-pitched voice over the main voice, or me over his main voice. And 
at the end of the day, you could say, even though you're two singers, or sometimes three with, with, with Kai, and everybody would think, okay, it's half a work, isn't it? But at the end of the day, it was four times more work than being the only singer, because when you're the only singer, you have to sing it, period. <laughs> so, but suddenly you are two, sometimes three singers, and there are so many possibilities. At the end of the day, if you check them out, if you want to check all the possibilities, you end up with singing much more <laughs> than, than if you would just be the only singer. So, yeah, we had help from the producer team, certainly Charlie and Dennis. They were always having, you could say, the last word because they listened to everything and said, yeah, you know, Michael, Michael sounds much better here. Um, Andy, you should actually rather take the other part or vice versa, Andy. And he's sounding better because it's more brutal. You need more rock and roll. And Michael, you should take the other part, which is more like like a flying thing. And so, yeah, it was fun, but a lot of work as well. Hmm. And well, uh, Skyfall was uh, written by Kai, mm -hmm. but the whole album has been like like the previous uh, Halloween albums. Because uh, Michael Wake uh, and you uh, have had most of the responsibility of the composition of the of the songs. Uh, do you feel that it's been a new kind of uh, composition or um, writing process, or it has been the same but with two more guys? A mixture of both. Yes, it has been the same with two more guys, <laughs> yeah, certainly, um, with at least one more guy con concerning songwriting, if, like Kai, Kai Hansen. Um, if you ask if there is like that, if that influenced the process of songwriting, yes and no. For me, speaking just for myself, I had two songs which were explicitly written for two singers. That's The Fear of the Fallen and Rise Without Chain where I had in the back of my mind, okay, you are two singers. I don't need to write vocal lines which have breaks for breathing. You just can overlap singing because I'm finishing my sentence. Michael is already starting the next sentence. This is something new. Yes, you could do that in, in, in studio production without problems, but this is something I try to avoid because I want to have it presented more or less the same way on, on stage than we recorded in studio. So this is always something you have in the back of your mind. Don't do that because you can't produce, reproduce it on stage. So rather stay away of it. This time, piece of cake. Just write it the way you think because you don't need to think about, oh, I'm the only singer, I have to, I have to breathe, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. It doesn't matter suddenly. So, so yeah, a mixture of everything you could say. Do you feel more comfortable if you have to sing that song's life? Um, well, now with Michael, it's much more comfortable because, you know, for example, when I'm sick, um, before Michael, it was a nightmare. Yeah. When I'm sick, I'm the only singer. So the only thing I could do is rather decide to cancel the show, which is very heavy. Or I knew, okay, tonight there will probably be the fight of my life, uh, but I have to go through with it and, and hope that I'm still up and running for the next day and not cancel the next show. Or, you know, when you're sick, you never know what happens. You do your best, but you're sick. Now with Michael in the band, it's still a lot of pressure, yes, but it's not that big of a nightmare. If you know, if I know I'm sick, I still feel shit but at least i don't have to be scared about the show because i know michael is up and running and i know that i can tell him to sing two or three songs more this tonight and i have two or three songs less i have my breaks in between where i can recover a little bit and, and gain enough strength to go out for the next song so that's a much much better life yeah and Well, uh, I want to know if you, when you were writing this new record, um, 
did you feel pressure because it's the most expected album of the I don't know if of the power metal history or in the heavy metal history Halloween reunited reunited so did you feel that pressure when you were writing the album yeah in the very beginning there was like the first one or two weeks and, and I realized this pressure is not helping at all because it gives you always this is it good enough is it good enough and at the end of the day you never have have an idea because you never think well oh, this is good enough so I, at, at the end of the day after two weeks I learned to live with the pressure and, and put it aside and tell myself, look, I mean, each and every album is giving you pressure. This album is giving you even more pressure. And maybe you just try to reduce it to a, to a healthy point where you are able to, to recognize good ideas and start working on these ideas and later on decide if it's good enough. Don't try to decide now if it's good enough when you even have only a guitar and a vocal idea. Just try to put it down and, and try to work on it. And not only for two or three songs, but try to write 10, 10 or 12 songs. Yeah. And then make the people decide if there's if there is songs in between the 12 ideas I have, which are strong enough for the band. Fortunately, we had already a listening session in, in uh, April 2019 and uh, early enough so to say and we 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 were happy to listen to lots of good ideas from the other guys and obviously the boys liked my ideas as well because they applauded big time and and i knew okay there are some good ideas and <laughs> relief you know <laughs> because yeah with that pressure in the back of your mind you never know if it's good enough it's uh, at the end of the day I just told myself, work the way you're used to work. Have fun. Just have fun. If I like it and I got some goose flesh going on, I think that's that should be enough to go on, keep on working on that idea. Put it that way. If it's good enough, I'm not the one to decide. So the band has to decide. Everybody has to decide. Unfortunately, everybody was happy when they listened to my ideas. I was super happy when I listened to the other ideas. So there was a big pressure coming off my shoulders hmm. because I knew... I don't have to write another five or six songs because there would not be enough sufficient good ideas. So when I listened to the ideas of the other boys, I was going like, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> great. And I would like to know how is uh, the, rela the relationship of the members of the band nowadays? If it, if it has changed from the beginning of the of the new Halloween era uh, until now? I could not say yes or no. I think... What do you feel? The tour, the tour was already so intensive and you, you stick together if you want or not at the airport, on stage, backstage, whatever. So the intensiveness was already maximum during the tour. So I think the studio time could give you even, they could, studio time is not as demanding as life, I think. Traveling the world together is definitely the, the moment where you realize you can do it, the chemistry is good or not. I think that's, that's the ball breaker. Hmm. In the studio, yes, you have to meet yourself uh, again and again, but if you really would not like somebody in the band, it would be easy to tell the producer, look, you record me from 10 o'clock nighttime to 2 o'clock morning, where, when you know you're alone and nobody's there. Uh, you could do that. In a life situation, you cannot do that. <laughs> you know, so yeah. Even if you would have people you really don't like, you despise, you have to meet them again and again and again and again. So I think the studio was not changing anything. It was more or less a walk in the park for everybody because of the sad circumstances that you could decide, um, I'm rather working when this or that guy is not there. But yeah. obviously this didn't, this didn't uh, affect us, didn't take place here. So everybody's 
I like she, I likes each other, and I did not ask the producer team to record me at ten o'clock in the night. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I was there with the boys, and everything was fine. Uh, and honestly, for the boys, it's super super boring. Sometimes they walk out of the studio after an hour or so because when the singers sing, it's boring because they sing it again and again and again and try this and try that, and sooner or later. You leave the sofa in the studio and go out to the swimming pool or go down to the beach and leave them alone. Hmm. I remember so, fr from everything. Yeah, I, I remember from the last tour when you were playing in Portugal and Santiago de Compostela. I remember I was uh, walking with with the photographer Javier Bragado, who took some of the pictures of the DVD in Madrid and there in in both uh, concerts in Portugal and and Spain. And I remember uh, I saw you with your, I don't know if you were with your manager, but you were looking for La Catedral de Santiago and you were in the wrong way. <laughs> and we go with, with you uh, saying, hey, it's not the way, come with us. Uh, I remember but in, in that, in both concerts, uh, you were um, smiling. The whole concert, and when we saw you there, uh, you were happy. Uh, it's a, it's the happiest moment of your life now with the situation of the band. Well, you definitely could compare it with back in the days, 1994, when we released the Master of the Rings album. That's that was one of these, ep, 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 uh, what's the right word? Epochs, areas, eras where where I was super happy when a. Uh, when we realized, okay, this is something that that the people would like, that the, or the people do like. When you realize you did something good, people are smiling down there, people are having fun down there. So I automatically have to grin. It's, I smile with them, I feel it. And I think that's, that's the whole thing, going out live. I see you smile and I know I did not do wrong. You see me smile and you know you did not do wrong. So everybody is like, it's an energy that's building up. Yeah. And this that's actually what happens now, and I could compare it with back in the days, 1994, with the Master of the Rings. Exactly the same thing happened there. People were suddenly have, being confronted with something new, so there's a new singer in that band. And suddenly you realize they are smiling, they have a good time, they are having fun, they are crazy, and, you know, suddenly you realize on stage, yeah, we did the right thing. Everybody's having fun. And this is exactly the feeling I have now. Because lots of people were super anxious to know what's going on with like Kai and Michael back in the band, but nobody knew will it do any good. I mean, or probably we would, would have some life fights, fist fights on stage, or what will happen? You, know? <laughs> you never know. I mean, we, had, we have so many examples of bands who tried that. Exactly the, the stuff we do now, uh, Years back in time, uh, Van Halen was trying with David Lee Roth and Sammy Hager in one band. And I, I think it took two or three shows and then they nearly, nearly killed each other. Yeah. I mean, you never know. It's, it's, people are people and sometimes you get along with people and sometimes you just, just don't. I mean, you know. So for me, that's, uh, that's that feeling that I already had in 94, which I, I'm glad to have that feeling back again because it's great Every, everything works out fine and it's like a dream come true as we all know i mean being a musician and suddenly you end up in the biggest concert halls available through nearly the whole friggin planet this what else could you ask for <laughs> and after that tour you do an album and now people are going like wow well, i like the album you did a good job here perfect world yep and um, how have you changed How have you feel the change of uh, the period of Master of the Rings uh, and the last record in terms of uh, writing process or your position or your role in the band? How have you feel the changes? Well, for me personally, it's a lot of a lot of responsibility taken off my shoulder because not being the only singer means also I don't have the complete responsibility for the vocals, which in itself shows you that there's whew, something <laughs> that share is, is definitely not weighing as heavy as if you don't have to share it, certainly. 
second uh, with Michael and Kai in the band, you have definitely two important opinions, which very often lets me lean back and just listen. I don't need to say a lot. Waiki as well, he leans back, listens, and most of the time there's already a solution in the room without discussing. And back in the days, without Kai and Michael, most of the decisions was sometimes on my shoulders. So, Andy, you decide. Whatever it could be, traveling or name of the album or which songs and, and there are songs there are albums i had to write nearly 10 songs for an album which is a lot of pressure if we talk about pressure these albums were a lot of pressure for me because when i realized there's not enough ideas and the producer comes to me and tells me andy you have to write another three or four songs because we don't have enough ideas that's pressure <laughs> even more when the studio is already booked so I had these days, and uh, I would I would love to say, and, and, and I mean it, that with Michael and uh, Kai in the band, there are two people who are willed to make decisions, who are willing to look for solutions, and this takes a lot of pressure off my shoulders, definitely. So you felt that high pressure uh, with the first album, with Master of the Rings. Yeah, you you, you joined the band and you had that big pressure on your shoulders. That too, but it, it became more and more pressure with each and every album because um, before Sasha joined the band, for example, I had nearly all the pressure together with Waiki to, to write enough good songs for an album. Uh, Roland, back in the days, the, the guitarist back in the days, he nearly wrote no songs. So it was not somebody you could rely on that he is having some songs for Halloween, even though we knew that he would have great songs, but he always used it for his solo album. Yeah. <laughs> so at the end of the day, I was seeing myself at the one who is asked again and again and again, we need more songs, we need more songs, we need more songs. And this is not really giving you a, an easy life because I'm writing, as I told you, I'm sitting on the sofa, I'm writing songs because, of, because out of my hobby. Hmm. I'm watching television and television is getting boring, so boom, I got the guitar here, look, watching television and diddling and fiddling and, oh, what's that? So I switch off the telly and I'm working on some stupid idea that I have and maybe that stupid idea becomes a great song. You never know. A hobbyist. I'm a hobbyist. That's how I started out and I've never changed that because I think that's the most honest form of writing songs because... And I'm in the happy situation. I don't need to push myself to write songs in a certain direction, which are maybe not in my blood. I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to write rock songs. And at the end of the day, after that idea that I have, you arrange it. You decide to make it harder, higher, slower. Maybe it's a good, a good rock ballad at the end of the day, or it's maybe one of these brutal power metal things that I have. It's, it really depends on how you arrange it. Maybe just to remind you how many tears the song used to be a ballad. So Waiki, I, I, I know the original ballad. Hmm. How many tears flow away? And you go like, wow, what a beautiful ballad. And now you listen to it, it's a power metal monster, yep. you know? So it really depends on how you how you arrange it. But the, the initial song idea doesn't change. Hmm. So I'd rather see myself as a hobbyist, sitting down there, collecting song ideas because I love it. But if you tell me, oh, Andy, we don't have enough songs. Now write new songs. We need desperately another three or four songs. That's where the stress for me starts because I have to push myself to write songs. And I never intended that to do. I always wanted to write songs because I love to write songs and not because I have to write songs. Yeah. And this is a pressure that, that's taking off my shoulders now because Sasha Gerstner joined the band and he suddenly, wow, there was a new songwriter. And for me, it was like, whew, great, another <laughs> songwriter. Now with Kai in the band, even more, whew, I know I don't have to look for the sequel of a Halloween or Keep It the Seven Keys long song blah 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 i can't do it we did it in with the the king for a thousand years i i did it with waiki but it's 
it's not my cup of tea. To be honest, it's not my cup of tea. I think we should rather leave that stuff for the people who love to do it. And Kai loves to do long songs. So, perfect. <laughs> he loves to do so long songs. Do your long song. Andy likes to do lots of shorter songs. Let him do lots of lot shorter songs. <laughs> and uh, perfect. Yeah, I've, I've seen that when I when I've been checking the um, the track list of the of the album, uh, you have wrote the the shortest. Uh, songs and Wakey and uh, um, of course uh, Skyfall, which is 12 minutes, are the um, are the longest songs. Uh, I would like yeah. to know, um, um, talking on the last question about Master of the Rings, uh, if you remember some some funny or some hard uh, uh, anec anecdote from that from that period of of your of your life when you joined uh, Halloween. Well, it was lots of goods and bads. <laughs> um, anecdotes. Well, I think the whole the whole process was an anecdote because Waiki and Marcus gave me a call on the 29th of December in '93, and uh, I just listened to what he had to say that he just wanted to kick uh, out Michael, and if I would not join Halloween, he would just uh, Split the band, period, end of Halloween. And me as a long, long, long years friend, because I hang out with Michael oof, since 1986. Mm -hmm. So, and I was still in my pink cream bubble, but Waiki always smells when something is wrong. He's got that third eye or whatever you name it. Second ass. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was thinking about that. That third eye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Third eye or second asshole. I don't know. <laughs> But he, he, he smells when something is wrong. I mean, he smells it. And we didn't have, we didn't speak for at least like two months. And suddenly he rings me up. Again, on the, in the very, on the very day after I had the biggest trouble with my pink cream boys I ever had in the history. So I was really pissed off with my boys and Waiki rings me up and tells me that he want to fire Michael Kiske and if I would not join the band, he would probably rather split up Halloween. And I said, okay, I just had the biggest trouble with my boys. You know what? I'm taking the next train <laughs> and I, I come to visit you, but I will not decide before next year. <laughs> 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 Let me enjoy New Year's Eve. <laughs> yeah. So I on the on New New Year's Eve I went to Hamburg. We had a meeting, and my biggest concern was that the, the biggest trouble I had with my Pink Green boys was they listened to my demos for the for the new album, <clears throat> and they said they don't want to play any of the songs because they think they are too commercial, mm -hmm. and they want to rather go into the direction of Alice in Chains, blah blah blah. And I was like devastated. I was like, I mean, we are Pink Cream 69. We have our own style. We have some success going on here with our own identity. Why would you copy bands already existing? Yeah. When we have so many bands now copying Pink Cream 69. Uh, for me, it was so stupid. And it was some harsh words and like really, yeah, not nice. So to, to cut a long story short, I went to Hamburg. We had this listening session. I heard what they had to tell me. They listened to what I had to tell them. And I told them, look, um, here's my demos. Here's my song ideas. Because as far as I understood, the studio is already booked. And we have to be in the studio in three weeks. So you want to fire your singer, but be back in studio in three weeks. Mm -hmm. So we need to have a, lots of song ideas. And in the next three weeks, we have to rehearse the shit out of ourselves if we want to make that happen. So listen to my demos and tell me what you what you think. So they listened to my songs and believe it or not, Marcus and Waiki were both sitting there like like this. <laughs> I mean you saw the, the, the shine in their eyes. I mean you saw they loved what they heard. And I had to ask myself in the very moment, so 
what is my band? The Pink Cream, who just told me they don't like the songs, they don't want to play that? Or Halloween, who listens to the songs and you see the gleam in their eyes and the smile on their faces? So oh, the next yeah. day, on the 1st of, this, of January, after one night in the hotel, I told them I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a hard decision. <laughs> no. no. Uh, yeah. I, And, and well, um, as I told you before the interview, uh, I want to ask you about your five, uh, five, favorite, five favorite albums of all time. Okay. Um, what are your five and why? Oh, well, uh, I would start with Level Headed from the Sweet. And uh, why? Because there's a song on it called Love is Like Oxygen. And this was the first riff. Everybody knows it. Yeah. And believe it or not, everybody can play it on the first day he ever grabs a guitar. <laughs> and so that's how I started actually playing guitar when I realized, whoa, that's how it goes. And I can play it. I mean, it doesn't sound good, but at least I know what he's playing or think I know what he's playing. And uh, as, as a bloody beginner on the guitar, I was, I was able to play that. It's like a smoke and on the water. <laughs> yeah, everybody can play that too. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. people, the Purple was always a band I liked, but it was never my idol band, yeah. except the singer. When Ian Gillen joined the band, um, I have to admit I was blown away. Probably Ian Gillen together with uh, Rob Halford and, and Ronnie James Dio were my greatest influences. Paul Stanley from Kiss as well. So you see the dilemma here. Different technique singers. Hmm. And actually that's where I ended. I, I, I kind of built a bridge for myself to be capable of singing everybody in my style. Mm -hmm. And it worked. But uh, concerning albums, as I said, Level Headed from the Suite. Definitely Kiss Alive 2. I was completely blown away when I first listened to a live album with such a mass of people. I mean, actually, it's just people you hear. And uh, that was, for me, the first thing that triggered me. Oh, okay, you could stand on a stage and people will have that much fun just by seeing your band and doing that party that's going on here with Kiss. Unbelievable. So that, that really triggered my dream mm -hmm. to be, become somebody on stage not only making music in your home, but maybe out going out there on stage. Wow. Dream. Um, next album, um, Unleashed in the East, Judas Priest. That's for, because that was my introduction to Judas Priest. And through the Unleashed in the East, I bought album and album and album to actually know the originals. And honestly, sometimes I was very disappointed because I thought the majority of songs on the Unleashed in the East sound much better than the, the studio productions. Hmm. And sooner or later I found out because of the speed, the, the tempo. Yeah. Unleashed in the East is played much faster. And I loved it. And then when I listened to the studio albums, every, everything went down to kind of slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. <laughs> um, yeah, it should happen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but uh, that, that, that was the introduction to Priest and one of my favorite albums still on my iPod or on my iPhone. Hmm. Um, well, there's a lot of, lots of bands I could mention now, but to not to, not to get, get stuck in the old days only, I would go with a band like uh, Deftones, uh -huh. White Pony. It's a classic. Yeah. yeah, for me, it opened a lot of, lot of brain cells that so far had been closed that you could actually combine some cinematic, disharmonic stuff, even with power metal. Because if you're singing, even in power metal, when you're singing about some goofy, mystic, mystical stuff, scary stuff, hmm. maybe why, why shouldn't there be a cinematic effect? Disharmonic. So far, it was not allowed. Ooh. But you can do that. And uh, sometimes it's only a second or two seconds, but it gives you the feeling that you want to 
submit to the people that something is wrong here on purpose. And yeah. This is something that, that, that was definitely brought in by, by people like Deftones, bands like Deftones. Def then uh, I would definitely nowadays I listen to Porcupine Tree mm -hmm. live again. It's also a very good live band, so I would highly recommend uh, a great live album from Porcupine Tree. Um, very experimental, very good musicianship. A bit of a mixture of a bit, a bit of Pink Floyd meeting, I don't know. Alternative rock going back to... They got everything. So for, for as a musician, I like that band. Yeah. Because it's from the musicianship, it's high standard. As I said, it's a bit of your, a bit of Pink Floyd meeting Rush. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Sometimes something like that for people who don't know the band. If you don't like Pink Floyd, don't listen to them. If you don't like Rush, don't listen to them. <laughs> but if you like if you like them, listen to Porcupine Tree. I think it's a great band. And uh, yeah, in the, the last two months or two and a half months, I play up and down the new corn. The nothingness. Uh huh. I love it. Great album, and I'm into Corn since the Issue album. So uh, also a great band who brought great new influences into into metal music. Even though it's always a question of taste, as we all know. Yeah. But as a musician, I'm always keen to listen what's going on, and I try to open my ears if there's something going on that I like. So I don't go and say it's something new. I don't like it because it's not classic power metal. Uh, for me as a musician, it would be wrong because there's always spices that maybe bring power metal into the next uh, area or into the next tier or whatever you may call it. But I don't want to stand still. I want to actually have little bits and pieces, spices that I could add into our own music. And I think that's also very important. Yeah. Um, as long as I like it. I think the same as you. Yeah. I, I think the same. I, I would definitely refrain of bringing rap mu music into power metal or bringing techno stuff into power metal or, you know, that stuff that I don't like. I definitely want far away from my stuff that I do, far away. But as long as I like it, I always try to think about putting in these spices if possible. Sometimes I don't because it, do, it doesn't fit, but sometimes it's just a second or, or a, very, a little moment here and there where I try to make it a bit more interesting. Hmm. I don't know if the listeners will realize it, but it's, it's for me. It's just for me. Well, a recommendation of myself. If you, I don't know if you know them, but um, Gojira, Gojira. We, which is a, f a band from France, have released uh, a new album. The last, uh, well, the final of in the final of April, and it's called Fortitude. Uh, I recommend a lot. I think that for Fortitude. me, Fortitude, Fortitude from uh, Gojira, G O J I R A. In Spanish, the pronunciation is uh, Gojira. Gojira, Gojira. Okay. So I, I recommend it for me uh, uh, of the albums I've listened to this year. Uh, well, your album for me is the is the best one. So congratulations! But this one I told you, uh, uh, 42 from Gojira, uh, is the second for me. So I recommend you a lot. Oh, and well, the whole the whole discography of the band Gojira, I think is I amazing. Think they have a, a strong K -O -K -I -R -A. personality. Yes. K O J I R A. Yes, it's it's from friends. The the drums are amazing and the uh, guitar parts are very experimental and it's amazing. I recommend you. Well, they are the, uh, on the cover of the May issue of Power Magazine and well, Halloween was in the first issue, so congratulations. We will Thank send you. you a copy to your house. And well, the, the last thing I would like to talk is about the tour. You have a tour scheduled uh, over Europe with Hammerfall. 
Uh, what are you preparing for that tour uh, with the sonography and the set list? Um, have you think about it now? Because it's in almost a year. Well, con concerning the the set list itself, we still have to wait. I mean, there are the must plays, as you know. There's six or seven songs you have to play if you want or not. They probably kill you if you don't. Hmm. Um, for the rest of the of the set list, we have to wait. Uh, for the people, actually, as, as always, we want to know what the people would like to listen to. So it's on Halloween.org. Everybody can say what he wants to listen to. And certainly this will not take place until August or September that we finally bring the, the main set list onto paper because we have to wait for the reaction of the people concerning the new album. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I would say 60-70% of the set list is always decided by the people. And uh, let's wait and see what, what songs they would love to listen from the new album. And uh, then we have hopefully a good, nice set list that goes up and down and up and down and up. It's always very important that you have these waves. And that very much depends on the songs they choose. Sometimes you have to get rid of one song and bring in another song that we think is better when it comes to the up and down of a show. As you know, we have probably again two, two and a half hour show. It will not be a, a three hours and three hours ten that we used to play when we've been on, on stage alone. This time it's a force, uh, a united force with, Hello, uh, with Hammerfall and so uh, we'll definitely not be on stage for over three hours again. Well, two it's, hours is not. Yeah, it's, very, hours. it's a long concert. Two hours plus. Halloween is always having a two hours plus show, but three yeah. hours plus will not be. So, like last time, and also because our drummer is not getting younger. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, I remember the the show of Madrid. I was there uh, where you recorded a DVD. Uh, this is the last question. Um, do you think that's the best? concert of Halloween in the story of the band? The, the Wisnet Center in, in, yeah. in Madrid? Well, this was fantastic. Uh, if, if we talk about these dream come true concerts, where you're really having a packed concert hall at the Wisnet Center with thousands of, yeah, what, what's the right word? Enthusiastic, crazy people and video cameras and everything is on spot on that very night and every, everything works, everything is cool. That's, uh, that's a night to remember, definitely, definitely. So if we, if we would go for the concert of the year or of that tour, if de it definitely would be around in, inside number three, two or one. So top three, definitely. I mean, we had other concerts which were fantastic as well. But I could not tell you that it's not number one. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely one of the top three in the world, definitely. Okay, that's could a good. Could be number one, but this is, uh, I would have to go inside myself and, and look at the other great number one num uh, uh, in the top three shows. Like uh, in Germany, for example, we had Stuttgart was fantastic. Hamburg was definitely fantastic. It was a homecoming for, for the band. Yeah. Uh, even though the concert itself was not as spectacular as Wisnet Center, for example. So it's a sport, the biggest sports hall in Hamburg, and it's very, what's the right word? Cold, a cold concert hall, not really nice. Yeah. Typical German, very pr pragmatic, but nothing special. But the people made it special. Madrid was... The people made it special and the concert hall was super nice. So the whole visual thing was, wow. I mean, the sports hall, hall in, in, in Hamburg definitely cannot compete with the Wisnet Center in Madrid. <laughs> Just that, that one of these mega big sports hall, nothing else. Not very nice. So if you look at the Wisnet Center, this is probably one, if not the nicest concert hall you can play in. So... That's why it's definitely number three. The people were crazy, so maybe it's number one. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's the number one. So, <laughs> it's the number one. <laughs>
And well, who do you think, uh, what team do you think will win the Spanish league of football? Atlético de Madrid, Barcelona or Real Madrid? <laughs> I don't want to piss you off, but it needs to be Barcelona. <laughs> well, I want Real Madrid, but let's see. We have a few weeks left, so we'll yeah. see who wins. <laughs> Fingers crossed for Barcelona. I'm sorry, my friend. For, for Real Madrid. <laughs> my shoes. <laughs> so, uh, Andy, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure and hope to see you again in Santiago de Compostela or in Barcelona or in Canary Island or in Madrid or whatever. <laughs> so, okay. thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks for your time and uh, have a great day. You too. Bye.